Okay, so um, right. So before we start today, I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, so there is a PCMI cross-program activity uh, today. It's a panel discussion on career arcs, um, which everyone is uh, strongly encouraged to go to. It so so this panel discussion is at uh, twelve thirty Mountain Time, and the link is in the email that was sent out. Um, so this does conflict with the usual time for the TA session, and I believe the TA session today is likely to be moved um, probably to some, sometime after that, but um, maybe just confirm, maybe I can confirm at the end or, uh, or check Discord for, um, to confirm the time of the TA session. So, okay, I'll let Dustin um, start it. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, we're gonna have some fun today. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Um, so um, yeah, we're going to be talking about reduction theory of. Uh, there's a lot of adjectives of uh, positive, definite, binary, integral, quadratic forms. I think I got them all in there, but let's just let's just um, say what we mean. So let's recall. <laughs> let's recall the the context we had from last time. So. We're interested in uh, quadratic forms um, over the integers, and we're looking at the uh, smallest non-trivial case, which is two variables. So a binary quadrat, that's called a binary quadratic form, integral, is a polynomial of the form uh, f of xy is equal to ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, or a, B, and C are integers. So it's a homogeneous degree two polynomial in two variables. Um, for shorthand, we're also gonna denote this as um, uh, left brackets, A comma B comma C, right brackets. But be careful, this is not consistent with the previous use of this notation where this stood for a diagonal form in three variables ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared. Now the b here stands for the cross term xy. And in general, not every such guy is going to be diagonalizable. We'll actually see this as a consequence of something we do today. Um, so there's no use in the diagonal notation. It does, it's not general enough. So this will be the new notation. But I'll just put this caution symbol here to uh, not consistent with, with previous. OK. Um, all right, and the most important quantity in the most important in, in invariant you associate to this, uh, such a binary quadratic form is its discriminant, which is just the usual expression b squared minus 4ac. Um, and we will assume, uh, we will be assuming that uh, the corresponding, if you take the same polynomial but view it as a real quadratic form, um, then the, we'll be assuming that that's positive definite. And as we explained last time, that's equivalent to some you know, other properties of this form. For example, um, you know, f of x, y is greater than zero, uh, unless of course, uh, x, y is equal to zero. So the values are always non-negative and in fact, strictly positive unless uh, you're, you're evaluating at zero. Um, and it's also equivalent to a numerical criterion involving D. So, well, the discriminant of F should be less than zero. And um, well, to separate between the positive definite and the negative definite cases, you can say that A and C or, or equivalently just one of them has to be positive. So both A and C are values of F, right? On, on one comma zero and zero comma one respectively. So they have to be positive. And that actually is enough to guarantee that you're positive definite. Um, once you have this condition as well, because you're either positive definite or negative definite, right? And then that shows, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so from now on, so form means such a guy. So it's a positive definite integral binary quadratic form. It's an F like this satisfying these equivalent conditions. Um, 
So that I'm just going to say form for that. And you'll have to remember that it's positive definite, for example. And we talked about the notion of um, equivalence of forms that we're going to be uh, using. So, uh, so also recall, we say that f is equivalent to f, well, strictly equivalent, to, uh, sorry, f is strictly equivalent to g um, if and only if they're related by an invertible change of variables. Uh, with determinant equal to one. So in general, an invertible matrix over the integers will either have determinant one or minus one, and we want to only look at those, we're making a finer equivalence uh, where we don't um, require the determinant to be equal to one. So concretely, this means that you can write uh, that if you take f of like alpha x plus beta y, uh, gamma x plus delta y, uh, then this gives you g of x, y for some uh, uh, alpha, uh, beta, gamma, delta in SL2z. So the group of um, integer two by two matrices with determinant one. Okay. Um, now, so these are going to be our favorite characters from now on. Um, so, well, also, ah, oh, I just accidentally hit my camera. Um, okay. So, also recall. Oh, sorry, now it needs to be adjusted. That if f is strictly equivalent to g, then in particular, uh, the discriminants are equal to each other. That was something we also saw last time. Um, um, however, let me remark. Uh, well, there are many, so that, so, well, well, this is not invertible. So this is not a if and only if. So discriminants being equal is also a coarser equivalence relation than being strictly isomorphic. And in fact, you can put a whole bunch of different rather natural um, equivalence relations sitting in between the strict equivalence and the equality of discriminants. So let me just write a chain of implications here. So F is strictly equivalent to G implies F is isomorphic to G. And this, I mean, in the sense of, you know, using GL2Z instead of SL2Z, so arbitrary invertible linear change of coordinates. This in turn implies that F is isomorphic to G over the p-adic integers for all primes p, um, which in turn implies that F and G are isomorphic over the rational numbers. Uh, which in turn, I guess, implies that the dis that already implies that the discriminant of f is equal to the discriminant of g, and in general, all of these implications are strict. And um, well, maybe there's one implication that's not quite obvious. I guess this one. So why if they're isomorphics over the p-adic integers for all p are the isomorphic over the rationals? Um, can anyone give me the reason? I think you can use asymptotes. So this can use what? I'm sorry? Asymptotes. So f and g have all coefficients in z. So yes, exactly. So if you're isomorphic over ZP, then you're certainly isomorphic over QP. But on the other hand, oh, G, sorry. Since F and G are both positive definite, they're also isomorphic over R. Because there's only up to isomorphism, there's only one positive definite quadratic form over R with you know, plus plus in terms of Sylvester's law of inertia. So then by Hasse Minkowski, uh, uh, this implication holds. Um, and yeah, um, actually, wait, does this implication? Oh, I think I might have ended up confusing myself here. This only implies that these are equal up to squares. Oh, geez, I might have confused myself here. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, let me, let me put just, I don't want to have to, I don't want to get something wrong. So let me put this here instead. Uh, 
I, I, I might have been mistaken in the argument there. Anyway, in general, all of these implications are strict. And you saw some examples of strictness of implications in your problem set um, from last time. Now, we're going to be interested in, whoops. Be studying uh, the set xd. Uh, so, for, for you know, for d a possible discriminant, so d a negative integer, the set xd, which is the set of uh, equivalent strict equivalence classes, of forms uh, of discriminant d. So forms with df equal to d. So we're going to be taking this course invariant the discriminant and asking to classify all uh, all possible forms of a given discriminant. And it turns out that this is sort of the best question to ask in this uh, two variable case. I want to mention that outside of the two variable case, the classification by discriminant is much too coarse to be kind of a useful um, way of classifying forms. And in that case, it's this one uh, that is the appropriate uh, general notion. And this is called, this, in this case, we say that F and G uh, are in the same genus. And the thing you want to do in general is ask to classify equivalence classes of forms of the same genus. And that gives results somewhat analogous to the ones that we're going to be talking about here in the two variable case. However, in the two variable case, because of special phenomena that appear, which we'll explain, it's actually, you actually get a better result by classifying forms with the same discriminant rather than forms of the same genus, so slightly coarser. And in fact, you can understand forms of the same genus in terms of the results we'll describe about forms of the same discriminant. So in, in generality, you'd want to look at classify forms of the same genus, but we're going to look at forms of the same discriminant because that's the nicest thing in this special case we happen to be considering. So that's, that's just a general remark um, to orient you a little bit in the general theory. Um, right, so we're interested in studying this set. Let me check my notes and make sure I didn't. Um, ah, right, anything. So what's the first question you can ask about a set? Um, is it empty or not? So for which D is uh, XD non-empty? In other words, given a negative integer d, when does there exist a, um, a form of discriminant d? So, uh, well, note that by definition, d is equal to b squared minus 4ac. So it's congruent to b squared mod 4. Um, in other words, d has to be a square mod 4, uh, which means that d has to be, whoops, d has to be congruent to 0 or 1 mod 4. And conversely, if d is congruent to 0, 1 mod 4, it's actually not difficult to explicitly write down uh, a form of discriminant d. So if uh, d is congruent to 0 mod 4, uh, then the form f equals x squared plus d divided by 4 y squared has discriminant f equal to d. Um, and if D is congruent to one mod four, uh, then F equals X squared plus X Y plus one minus D over four. You should always remember that D is negative, yeah? Um, ooh, oh, I, I didn't remember D was negative. That's better. Uh, <laughs> uh, plus one minus D over four Y squared uh, has discriminant D. Ah. ah, sorry guys, my pen is failing me here. Has D, F equals D. So the answer to this first question of when the set is empty is um, the set is, em is non-empty if and only if D is congruent to zero, one, one, four. And these sort of so-called, so I mean, these sort of obvious forms you write down actually do play a, they're not just random examples. They actually play a, a special role in the story. So these, Specific forms are called the uh, principal 
uh, form of discriminant B. Uh, or you might more generally call a principal form anything in the anything which is strictly equivalent to one of these two forms. But we'll see that these two also have a, spe a special extra property which characterize them in their equivalence class. Um, and the principal forms do play a special role in this theory. So it's not just a, an example that you can write down. Um, okay. Uh, right. Now I want to give you a first reason why this question is a natural question. So why it's natural to group forms by discriminant. So um, here's one answer. There are actually several possible answers, but um, here's one. Um, and it has to do with this question we're interested in of which primes are which primes, for example, are represented by a given quadratic form. Um, so uh, here's a theorem. So let uh, D be negative and D congruent to zero or one uh, or one mod four. So D is a possible discriminant, in other words. Um, let P be an odd prime. Then P can be represented by some form of discriminant D, if and only if uh, some condition you can actually check. So if and only if uh, D is a square mod P. Now you can't say if D is a square mod P, you can't necessarily say that P is represented by some, I mean, if you fix the form beforehand, you can't necessarily, a uh, form of discriminant D beforehand, you can't necessarily say that P has to be represented by that form, but P will be represented by some random form that has the correct discriminant. So here you sort of have to take all forms of discriminant D into consideration a priori to get the, the good result about primes being represented. Um, and the proof is not too bad, so let's actually give it. Uh, so first let's give the, uh, forward direction. So let's assume that uh, P is equal to AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared. Um, well, since P has odd p valuation, in fact, p valuation one, it follows that um, uh, it can't be the case that both uh, X and Y are congruent to zero mod P. Because if both of them were divisible by p, then you'd be able to have you'd have a p squared on the right hand side, but you only have a p on the left hand side. Um, so that's uh, pretty simple. But let me reinterpret this. Let's. This means that if we reduce these numbers mod p, uh, this is non-zero. Uh, right. So in other words, it's a non-zero vector in the two-dimensional vector space over this finite field. So any non-zero vector over a field can be extended to a basis. So we'll extend uh, this guy to a basis of the two-dimensional vector space, you know, fp direct sum two, and then calculate the discriminant in this basis, or the discriminant mod p, I should say. So then what's the matrix going to look like? Well, our basis vector annihilates the quadratic form because p is equal to our quadratic form. Uh, and therefore, when you reduce mod p, 0 is equal to our quadratic form. So our, we're going to look something, we're going to look like 0, b, b, and then some c, right? Um, and then the determinant is going to be uh, uh, b squared. So we'll get b squared is congruent to d uh, mod p, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Um, so that means that B is a square mod P. Okay. So here I'm using that the, the determinant is the, I mean, the discriminant is minus the determinant of the matrix associated to the quadratic form. 
Okay, so now let's do the other direction. Um, well, it's actually pretty simple. I mean, um, yeah, if D is uh, if D is a square mod P, so then we can write D is a D is a equal to B squared plus four times. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. D is a square mod P. Um, uh, but D is also a square mod four because it's congruent to zero or one mod four. And then P is odd, so four and P are co-prime. So that implies that D is a square mod four P. Um, so I'm actually gonna use that. I'm gonna write D equals B squared plus four P times a random number, which I'll call minus C, right? Um, I'm allowed to do that. Um, and then this is supposed to give me what I want uh, because well, this means that D is the discriminant of the form F where uh, F is equal to uh, P X squared plus B X Y plus C Y squared. So it's sort of, um, you sort of just do it, just do it by hand. You can easily solve the equation discriminant. Yeah, well, anyway. Right, so that was that theorem. Um, so that says that, uh, yeah, prime is represented by some form of discriminant D if and only if uh, D is a square mod P. Now, um, let me make a remark. I didn't understand the uh, other implication. The, the second one or the first one? Second one, that's okay. the first one is correct. So our assumption was that D is a square mod P. However, we also have the hypothesis that D is congruent to zero or one mod four, which means that D is a square mod four. Right. And we have the hypothesis that P is odd. In other words, P is relatively prime to four. So by Chinese remainder theorem, it follows that D is a square mod four P. Right. Are we okay so far? Yeah. Okay, so then we just write what that means. It means we can find a B such that B squared is congruent to D mod four P. So D is equal to B squared plus some multiple of four P, which I'll call, which I'm calling minus C. Okay, yeah. And that equation just says that D is the discriminant of this form. Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very elementary. I'm not doing anything fancy here. Um, all right. Ah, so let me make, make a remark. So this condition we had, uh, that DP equals plus one uh, can be rewritten as a congruence condition. Modulo D, a congruence condition on P modulo D by quadratic reciprocity. So you have to break up into cases of according as to D is zero, one mod four, but in the end you find that indeed, in all cases, uh, you get a congruence condition mod D. So there was an exercise um, sort of similar to this, a couple of problem sets back. So let me give it just a, just a very simple example. So, uh, so uh, D equals minus four, uh, which is the discriminant of this uh, X squared plus Y squared. Um, then we have that minus four on P is equal to plus one, if and only if uh, P is congruent to one mod four. So it's a congruence condition mod minus D, which is the same thing as mod D. So, in, so because of this observation, this condition is actually, it's, it's very easy to check it for a given prime P. It's just a congruence condition mod of discriminant. Um, okay. Now let me explain a corollary of this theorem. So if it just so happens that the size of this set of equivalence classes of forms of discriminant D is equal to one, uh, then, um, then if uh, F is any form of discriminant D, we have that P is represented by F If and only if, well, it's, yeah, just the same thing. Uh, again, this nice congruence condition on P. Um, 
Why? Well, if you have any form of discriminant, so we know that this condition in general is equivalent to saying you're represented by some form of discriminant D, but when the size of this set is equal to one, that means any two forms of discriminant D are equivalent to each other. And the equivalent forms always represent the same set of integers because you can get back and forth by link, just do linear transformations in the variables. Um, so if it's represented by some form, it has to be represented by F. Yes, Eleftherios. In this argument that we just gave in the case where XD has just one element in it, well, one class basically of, of strong equivalence, yes. uh, we, don't, we didn't use anywhere the fact that the equivalence is strong, right? Because the fact that they okay. represent the same elements is from regular isometry. That's right. So you could say something a little more refined here. Absolutely. So this is not as um, it's not the strongest possible statement of this form, and that's a very good remark. Yes. Thank you. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. But anyway, this is going to be sort of uh, our general strategy. Um, so, all right. So now, what's the main theorem about this set XD? So, which we're going to prove today. Uh, so, for all d less than zero, well, I might as well add d congruent to zero, one, one, four, although the theorem is true without that. Um, XD is finite. So it may not always have just one element, um, but in, it, it is always finite. Um, so its cardinality is denoted HD and is called uh, the class number of D. Um, right. Um, but, but actually, the theorem is the theorem that we're going to prove is actually better than just this abstract statement that you have a finite set. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, given D, one can explicitly. Produced by a very efficient algorithm, um, finitely many forms. So, like F1 up to FHD uh, of discriminant D, such that every form of discriminant D is, uh, is strictly equivalent to exactly one of the FI. So you can actually make this completely um, explicit and algorithmic. So given D, you can actually figure out what the class number, you can calculate what the class number is and find representatives for all equivalence classes of forms of a given discriminant. Um, so before giving the formal proof, let me say what the basic idea is. Um, so basic idea is to, well, try to make a and B as small as possible. So you maybe you start with a random form A, B, C, right? And then you apply, you want to apply changes of variables in order to make A, and a or smaller or B smaller. Um, and then either one you win because eventually it'll get down to something really small and then there, there'll only be finitely many possibilities. So that's the basic idea. And to do it, we don't have to use we don't have to a priori use arbitrary elements of SL2Z. In fact, you only use two specific kinds of elements of SL2Z. Um, so you use uh, two kinds of change of variables. So the first kind is uh, where you, uh, you want to sort of swap X and Y, but that actually has determinant minus one. So you have to swap them and, and change the sign of uh, the other. So this corresponds to some matrix like, I guess, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Um, and what does this do on the level of forms? Well, 
you can just plug this in. So plug y and minus x into your, take f of y minus x and rewrite it in standard form. And you'll see that what happens is you get a, b, c. Uh, you can see that you can transform this into uh, c minus b, a. In other words, you're allowed to switch a and c as long as you change the sign of b. OK. Um, so that's the one kind of variable change. And the second kind of variable change uh, is, so let me make sure I get this right. So you can send x to uh, x plus k times y, uh, and you can just keep y fixed. So it's kind of a shear. Um, and this corresponds to, I might get this slightly wrong, but it's, uh, I guess it's this one. I could, you could make it upper triangle, use the upper triangular one instead, I don't know. Uh, so that, yeah, here k is gonna be an integer. Um, but actually this is just the, you only need this one because uh, this is the, just the k power of this element here uh, in the group SL2z. Um, yes, I love um, sorry to, to ask another question, but for the, the first kind of changes, should it not be the first column zero one and then minus one zero because X goes to Y and Y goes to minus X? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Although there is um, a question of whether it's the matrix or it's inverse that kind of, I love what I mean by this really. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. So, yeah. But in, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, right. So, um, if the notation he's using in for a second matrix is correct, then the first matrix is correct. Yeah, I think that now that's been inconsistent. Whereas before Eleutherius is common, that wasn't being consistent. So that's yeah. So uh, that that's good. Um, and anyway, in any case, we're not going to think about the matrices and so on. It's just going to be about how A, B, and C change. That's all we care about. So let me write down how A, B, and C change here. So A, B, C, uh, you can plug it in and check for yourself. I did it in my notes, so I'm not um, you know, bull crapping you. Uh, <laughs> it goes to A and then uh, B plus 2AK and then whatever the third one is. It's not going to be important for us. Um, and the third one is actually determined by the other two, right? Because we know what the discriminant is. So we can always solve for the other one. So we don't really need to keep track of C. We can just focus on A and B. That's also part of the general strategy. Um, right. So what does this move do? It keeps A the same, but it replaces B by a multiple of 2A. So we're allowed, we're allowed to fix A and replace B by a multiple of 2A. Um, OK. Now let me state the most precise form of the theorem, explaining exactly how to find this set of representatives. And this is called reduction theory. So this is the, the very topic of this lecture. So uh, the definition that you use is this. Um, so a form uh, A, B, C is reduced uh, if, um, so, so A and C are always positive, right? We said that, but B can have can be negative. It's possible for B to be negative. Um, but, but now we, we're gonna call the form reduced if the absolute value of B is less than or equal to A um, and A is less than or equal to C. So we're trying to make B and A small and this is the precise way in which we'll be able to do it. Um, and moreover, if we're in a boundary case, so if either A equals B, uh, Oh, sorry, A equals absolute value of B or A equals absolute value of C, then there's actually going to be some freedom and we want to fix that freedom uh, by requiring that B should be non-negative. Um, so we just have to handle the boundary cases. Uh, if we didn't throw this in, there would be two inequivalent forms, uh, two forms, two reduced forms, which are equivalent, which we're not going to want to have. So we have to choose one of them and we do it by fixing the sign of A and B in, if you're in a boundary case. Okay, so that's the definition of what it means for a form to be reduced. And now the most precise form of the theorem is the following. And I guess this is Gauss's, um, one of Gauss's results. He actually, I mean, he, he did everything we're gonna be talking about. Not, not everything, but he did a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about and more um, in his book, uh, Disquisitionis Arithmetica. Actually, there's a fun story about that book. So maybe I should plug this book. So 
In, it's uh, definitely the most famous book in all of number theory. One of the most famous books in all of mathematics. And it relates to the subject of our, our lectures in more than one way. So first of all, he discusses a, a lot of this theory of binary quadratic forms, integral binary quadratic forms that we're, we'll be talking about here in the second half. But he also is, was, gave the first proof of quadratic reciprocity. And uh, we also gave a proof of quadratic reciprocity in the form of uh, Hilbert's product formula, which uh, I said was due to Tate. But then here's a funny story, which Tate likes to tell that he came up with this calculation of K2 of Q. And then once he had done it, he realized that he'd seen that argument before somewhere, essentially. And it was in the very first proof uh, that Gauss ever gave the law of quadratic reciprocity, which is one of the first things he does in this book, this proof is known as the arithmetic day. So according to Tate, if you read this book and look at Gauss's proof of quadratic reciprocity, the first one that he has in there, then it is in essence the same as the proof of his calculation of K2 of Q and the deduction of Hilbert reciprocity from that. So it could be fun for you guys to, I, well, this book, you can't go wrong reading this book. It's just got so much amazing stuff in it. Um, but just that's just a little plug for one of the most famous books in our subject's history. Uh, right, anyway, I digress. Um, so, uh, Every form is, a, is a strictly equivalent to a unique form, uh, a unique reduced form. So in other words, yeah. So you, you make a list of all the reduced forms and then you've got up to strict equivalence, you've got exactly all of the forms. So no, no two reduced forms are strictly equivalent and every form is strictly equivalent to some reduced form. So yes, Eleftherios. And if we were to remove the condition of strict equivalence and replace it by equivalence, would we lose uniqueness? Uh, yes. Oh, I see, thanks. Yep. Yeah, a lot of things become less nice if you Use uh, isomorphism instead of strict equivalence. Um, okay, so let's give the proof. It's actually not too hard. Um, so let's first do existence. So suppose given f. So existence of a, of a reduced form in the. Um, so f, among all of the possible ABCs which are strictly equivalent to f, choose the one for which. Uh, or choose one of the ones for which uh, A is minimal. So A is a positive integer. So, uh, you know, it's, it's got a lower bound, right? So just take, take the least, least lower bound, the, yeah, the greatest lower, I don't know, the minimal, yeah. <laughs> I can't find more ways to say it. Choose one for which A is minimal among all possible options. Um, so then uh, the first claim is that, uh, that uh, right, uh, C has to be greater than or equal to, it, to A. So otherwise uh, you use the first move and you can switch A and C, right? You change the sign of B, but we don't care about that at this point. Right now we're making sure A is less than or equal to C. So that was one of the conditions in being reduced. A is less than or equal to C, so that's good. Um, but now we can use the, so now uh, then use the first, then they use the second move uh, to make sure uh, that absolute value of B is less than or equal to A. And in fact, you can do better. You can do uh, minus A strictly, uh, B strictly greater than minus A and less than or equal to A. Well, recall that the second move, it doesn't change A, but it moves B by multiples of two times A. So by shifting over using this, you can always make it land between minus A and A, right? That's an interval of length to A. Um, and you can choose which edge case you wanna keep. And we wanna keep the one where B is equal to A and not the one where B is equal to minus A. Um, and uh, okay, so we've already satisfied the first condition in the definition of reduced. So we just need to make sure the boundary cases that we can uh, have the boundary cases be okay. Um, so if A is equal to C, 
Um, then oh, I'm getting, I always get confused about these case distinctions. Um, well, let me say, uh, All right, so so there, if b is okay, if minus b is equal to a, um, no wait wait sorry, <laughs> absolute absolute yeah, I, absolute value of b equals a means that either a is minus b or a is b. A can't be minus b because we explicitly ruled that out by our choice here. Um, if a is equal to b, um, then since a is bigger than zero, b is also bigger than zero, so we're okay. So the only thing we need to worry about is whether is if a is equal to c. Uh, then we need to be able to change the sign of b, but we can do that using the, the first move again, which switches a and c. That doesn't do anything because a and c are equal, but changes the sign of b. Um, yeah, well, I won't write all that down, but um, you can arrange this by just using the first move again. The only case to consider is a equals c, and then you just use the first move to change the sign of b. So that's it. Well, for existence, okay? And actually, that's all we're going to need. Um, but I, so I'll, I'll go quickly through a sketch for the uniqueness. Well, what if there were two, right? So if f were strictly isomorphic to g and g prime, and these are both reduced, well, then g is strictly isomorphic to g prime. So it's enough to show that no two reduced forms can be strictly equivalent. Um, right. Uh, so the key claim for this, which is actually an exercise on your problem set, uh, is that if f is a reduced form, so and it's equal to a comma b comma c, then a is the least positive value of f. So since strictly equivalent forms always represent the same set of values, this means that if you have you know, two strictly equivalent forms, then at least the a's have to be equal, right? And then you have to do a little more argument to get the, the things themselves have to be equal. You have to see that if you have two strict forms with the same a, then any change of variables which goes from one to the other has to be a move of type two. Um, and then you can see that when they're reduced, this k actually has to be zero, because otherwise you'd be moving b out of the window um, that you're looking at. So. The, the main claim is this, and you need a little extra thing about what possible moves there are when the A's are the same, but it, it kind of falls out from how you prove this anyway. So I don't want to go too much into this uniqueness. Um, the existence is, is kind of you know, enough for the applications we're going to go into anyway. Um, okay, any questions about that proof? So let me make a let me make a remark. Um, well, as I presented it, it's not quite an algorithm, right? So how to given f, how to find uh, f prime equivalent to f with f prime reduced. So how do you explicitly find the change of variables? Um, so there's an algorithm, and it's very simple. It's a so the algorithm says you can either make a smaller by a move of type one or b smaller by a move of type two. Um, and you can, add, you can, so in practice, you can always just do it. You try to make a and b smaller and apply moves of type one and two and you'll succeed. In general, you have to alternate moves of type one and moves of type two. Um, so you have to go back and forth between them. Uh, and that's actually kind of, it's a kind of, it, it, at first it seems kind of re remarkable that you only need to use these matrices, uh, essentially, um, to make any two forms equivalent. But actually, if you look closer at what's going on here, you can use this kind of stuff to see that these matrices generate SL2Z. Uh, so it's not a coincidence that we only needed to use those two kinds of change of variables. And in fact, you can kind of read that off from the argument, plus a little calculation of what the automorphisms of a reduced form are, which is also on the problem set. Um, so um, yeah, so you, it's you know a good way to prove facts about groups like this fact 
is to make the group act on something interesting. And then you learn things about the groups. So this is an example. By considering the action of SL2Z on yeah, quadratic forms, so you can learn that this fact that these two things generate SL2Z. So that's, those are the only, the only things you need to make a form reduced. Um, so it's not quite obvious that that implies this fact, but it's, it's, it's on the problem set. Um, right. Uh, what else? Ah, now let's talk about the main corollary, um, which is the, the claim we had. So XD is finite. So let's give the proof of that. Well, so we need to see that the set of reduced F of discriminant D uh, is finite. Because every form is equivalent to a reduced one. So if that set is finite, then XD is finite. Um, so note that let me do a little. So the absolute value, d is negative, right? So if I want, I mean, I could say negative d. Oops, I used a small d when I meant to use a big d. Absolute value of d uh, is equal to four ac minus b squared. Now, because the form is reduced, um, we have that a is less than or equal to c. So this is greater than or equal to uh, four a squared. So c is greater than or equal to a, right? So this is greater than or equal to 4a squared uh, minus b squared, but absolute value of b is less than or equal to a. So I can also turn that inequality around and make this an a squared as well. Um, so this is because it's reduced. And that's equal to 3a squared. So this gives you a bound on a in terms of the discriminant. So a is less than or equal to the square root of a negative d over 3. But it feels weird to write square root of negative d when negative d is positive, so I'm writing absolute value of d instead. Um, I mean, negative d when d is negative. Well, well, anyway, you know what I mean, I hope. Uh, right. So we have a bound on a. Um, but that also implies, well, then, by definition of reduced, again, b is bounded by a. So absolute value of b is also less than the square root of uh, d over 3. And recall that a is positive, yeah? Um, so that means that both a and b, so the possibilities for a B are finite. And then, but D equals B squared minus 4AC, then fixes C in terms of A and B. So that proves the claim. OK. So here's a corollary. Well, I'm just sort of rethinking things. So if F1 dot 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 FH is the list of primitive forms of discriminant D, then, uh, well, H is equal to HD, um, and every form is. And, of a discriminant D is uh, equivalent to a unique uh, uh, Fi. So this is how you calculate class numbers. You just look at all the primitive forms of discriminant D. There's going to be only finitely many of them. Look at all the possibilities for A and B and so on. And then just, that's your list. And then the number of them is the class number. That's it. Simple as that. Um, so let's do an example. Our, our favorite example, d equals minus four. Uh, yes, Eleutherius. Uh, what do you mean by a primitive form? I, I cannot recall at the moment. Oh, did I, did I, wait, what, what, what's the word I used? Didn't you I said, say? You mean reduced. Reduced, ah, ah, sorry, uh, primitive is the wrong word to use. Primitive means something else. Ah, sorry guys. Uh, I hope I didn't make that mistake earlier. No, uh, yes, I meant reduced. Thank you so much for catching that. Um, Primitive actually means something entirely different. So uh, yeah, uh, just, okay. So D equals minus four. So let's put this into practice. So we saw that, so we know that zero is less than A is less than square root of uh, four thirds, right? Uh, less than less than or equal to, but it's an integer. So it's, I mean, well, whatever. 
So that, uh, uh, that means that A has to be equal to one. And then absolute value of B is less than or equal to A. And that, that means that B is either uh, minus one, zero, or one. Uh, but actually, since we ruled out, I mean, yeah. the, the border case condition uh, gets rid of the minus one, or less, that's not going to be so relevant. Um, but on the other hand, we have B squared minus four AC. So core times one times C is equal to minus four. And that tells you that B squared is congruent to zero mod four, um, which, and the only, since B is either zero or one, that tells you that B has to be equal to zero. Um, so A and B are uniquely determined and therefore so is C. So that tells you there's a unique uh, reduced form of discriminant minus four. Namely, x squared plus y squared. So a corollary of this is an odd prime p is of the form oh, can be written as x squared plus y squared if and only if p is congruent to 1 mod 4. So we did it. We proved one of our desired results. Um, kind of fell out of the sky, I guess. But the proof is that we just saw that h minus 4 is equal to 1. Um, so there's only one equivalence class of forms of discriminant minus 4. On the other hand, this was the condition for p to be represented by some form of uh, discriminant minus 4. So that's uh, good news. Um, so I also want to make another remark, which is just a small remark uh, that, you know, we wrote down these standard examples of forms of uh, discriminant D. So this X squared uh, minus D, D over four Y squared and um, X squared plus X Y plus one minus D over four Y squared. These are reduced. So, well, A and B are indeed very small, so you can believe it, but also you can just check that that is true. Um, so that's another justification. That's uh, so they are the reduced forms representing that equivalence class of principal forms. Um, so that was good. Um, and let me make one final remark. Uh, the class number being one is rare. Um, in fact, there are only nine values of D. For which it holds. So D equals, and I don't know it off the top of my head, so minus 4, minus 2, minus 3, minus 7, minus 11, minus 19, minus 43, minus 67, and finally everyone's favorite, minus 163. <laughs> um, so this isn't, yeah. Um, this is a theorem of uh, Higner, who was an amateur mathematician. And when he presented his result, nobody could follow what he was talking about. And they thought his proof must be wrong. And it took, I think, 20 years for someone to have people came up with another proof or a similar proof. And then they finally went back and realized, oh, wait, this Higner guy, he was actually making sense. We just couldn't understand him because he wasn't really speaking our language. That's a fun story in the history of math. He proved this amazing theorem. Right? It was an open question since Gauss. Um, you know, what, what were the Gauss conjecture? There are only finitely many values. Which ones that they are exactly? Yeah. Um, it's pinpointed by Hegner. And it led to his technique also led to a huge amount of advanced mathematics and important stuff in number theory. Um, so that's a pretty cool story. Um, all right. So that was what I wanted to talk about for today. And tomorrow we're going to switch gears slightly because we're going to be looking at the same subject from a, a new perspective. Um, so this perspective of quadratic fields and rings of integers and quadratic fields. So we'll have to do a little bit of an introduction to that and then we'll be able to make the connection between the two things, binary quadratic forms and quadratic fields.
I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with the fact that they both have the word quadratic in them. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Any questions? Oh, I have a. Or sorry, is this following the? Is this following uh, what is it called? Cox's prime to the form x squared plus n y squared, or? I put. That, or is this just a common argument? I put that book in the list because I know that book has a huge amount of stuff. I put that book. Okay. I actually haven't ever opened that book, okay. <laughs> so I'm not following it. <laughs> okay, because it's like the same. Point, right? So I mean, it's about the very, very subject we're talking about. So I assume everything I'm saying is in there. Um, like I remember, like the same arguments in there. So okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, but I have read Gauss. I have read Disquisitionis Arithmetic, so that might be where I'm getting this from. And Freddie is confirming that it is a good book. Sure, can I just make a quick announcement before uh, well, we can have more questions? But uh, so I think the plan is uh, so for the TA session to be right after the cross program activity. Uh, so 1.30 PM Mountain Time. So okay, I'll have more. I might not be able to make that um, that time, but the TAs are so great that I feel superfluous every time I show up. Uh, um, uh, Professor Rakim, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, if you look at the equivalence, uh, so we, we are looking at uh, the different uh, binary quadratic forms, non-equivalent binary quadratic forms, uh, up to action of S L two Z. Uh, that will be a bigger group. Now, if I look up to G L two Z, uh, that will be as uh, that will still be finite. It will be, uh, it'll in fact be smaller, right, than the class. Yes, indeed. Yeah, this the court, the set X D would get smaller if you use that. Yeah. Uh, why is that not uh, uh, given primary importance? Why is this class number given a separate name, etc.? Why is that not so important? Just because if I want, for example, just to give an example, if I wanted to state the analog of this, so I said every form is equivalent to exactly one reduced form. That's only true with SL2Z. If you wanted to say for GL2Z, you'd have to, I mean, it's not a big deal to, to make the modifications. Maybe, so maybe that's not the real reason. Okay, the real reason will come later in that there's a beautiful formula, in fact, for HD called Dirichlet's class number formula. And it doesn't look as pretty uh, if you write the formula for the analogous thing with uh, GL2Z. So there's just, it, it just turns out that when you work through the theory that if you understand the SL2 equivalence theory first, then it's, it, you, then you can, it is possible to deduce what's going on with the other one, but you can't go backwards. And the, the result for the GL2 equivalence just doesn't look as pretty as the result for SL2 equivalence. So it's definitely smart to do SL2 equivalents, I guess, for those two reasons. One, it looks prettier, and two, you can deduce the other one from this, but not backwards. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say, at least. There was also, Eleferius, you had your hand up at some point? Uh, actually, I wanted to ask the same thing that uh, Sandara did, so my question's covered. I uh, can I ask another question? Please. Is it just uh, so will so this result of uh, what's it? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Hag Hagner, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I can't find where I. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Hagner. So will this result follow from the class number formula that we're going to no. derive? No. No. It's that class number formula is really amazing. I mean. It's hard to use. I mean, first of all, I don't think I, I, I don't know any um, 
argument why a priori argument for why the value of the formula is even a, you know it's an, an integer when you look at the formula but that it should be a positive integer is actually not so easy to prove and that the only way i know how to prove it is by proving the class number formula and so saying it counts something and it, it's actually not so easy to make an, a direct analysis of the class number formula so that's not how it goes the argument is much more interesting than that um yeah I see. Thank you. It uses, I mean, at least in the modern understanding of what Hegner was doing, it uses some sort of advanced topics in arithmetic geometry. I mean, for example, so in the, these uh, rings of integers in imaginary quadratic fields, they also play a special role in the theory of elliptic curves because um, they can act on elliptic curves. Endomorphism ring of elliptic curves can be rings of integers in imaginary quadratic fields. Um, uh, and that's about all they can be I mean, um, uh, if they're not just Z. Um, so there are some special elliptic curves and this gives special points in the moduli of elliptic curves. And these points are now called Hegner points. And it's by studying the arithmetic geometry of these moduli spaces that you eventually whittle down the list of possibilities of class number to the ones given by Hegner's list. Um, yeah. Thank you. So it's a completely different kind of argument from the class number formula. I guess they're called CM points, and then Hegner points are if you map that moduli space to something more explicit than the image of them. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. CM as in complex multiplication. Yeah, exactly. I see. Oh. I think I have even even one more question. Sorry, they just kind of come up as I'm looking at my Your notes. Questions are great. Everyone's questions are great. Um, so please just feel free. So we saw in this in today's lecture that we get this nice uh, generating set for SL2Z, which is just two matrices actually, given yeah. by this action of SL2Z on on the forms that we were considering today. Yeah. And you said that it's it's a generally a good strategy for some groups if you want to find a generating set that's nice have them act on some set and look at that action do you have any other example in mind of like a group action that gives me information about the group itself like oh there are too many to name uh let's see oh uh this is kind of the classic example or you can make sl2z act on all sorts of related objects, the upper half plane, there's a, a tree you can write down. Um, but yeah, I, oh boy, there's so many. Okay, I mean, there's a there's a kind of generalization of SL2Z. SL2Z generalizes to a concept called an arithmetic group, which is more or less something like the integer points of some matrix group, so. It could be SLNZ, GLNZ, or an orthogonal group over Z. These are all um, arithmetic groups. And for every arithmetic group, you can write down a really nice topological space. Um, in fact, Riemannian manifold on which um, on which the group acts. And the question and finding fundamental domains for this action. Um, so the kind of like a notion of a reduced point in this topological space. So Quillen's you know finding a representative for each orbit oftentimes gives you by techniques of so-called geometric group theory, uh, gives you an understanding of the group. For example, generators and relations or cohomology calculations or things like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so one of the best ways to understand arithmetic groups is through this action on this, um, yeah, so-called associated symmetric space. Um, so that's a big class of examples, but I mean, they're really just all over the place. If you have any group, one of the main techniques in studying it is just devising some, some nice topological space on which it acts. Um, yeah, what are some other good examples? Akil, do you have are any popping to your mind? Well, I, I guess a lot of, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe 
right? Mary, because many groups are sort of defined through um, like they act on or sort of automorphisms of something. Um, but I, I mean, I guess like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that I think there are like lots of examples of, uh, I mean, sorry, I guess things like uh, uh, um, mapping class groups and all, all these things are sort of studied by making them act on some some object. Um, but I guess maybe very concretely, yeah, sorry, maybe I don't have a better answer right now, but I, I guess in general, I think one studies, one typically studies groups by, in terms of their actions on. Oh, wait, isn't, yeah, just on a more elementary level, isn't there some proof of the Silo theorems by making G acting on like subsets? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I yeah. forget how it goes, but there's something that's act on subsets of a given cardinality. Yeah, so that's, I guess that's a minor example of this kind of phenomenon. Um, or, yeah, you have your hand up again, though, Eleftheris? Uh, or even because it just came to me like as a as a probably very elementary example, maybe the first example we see, could it be Cayley's theorem that even if you have a group acting on itself, you get Cayley's theorem and you can view it as a well as a subgroup of some SN and maybe you can do some computations more easily if you represent it as a subgroup of a symmetric group. I don't know. Just, I don't really see. Uh... The action of a group on itself by translation. I'm not sure that yeah. maybe it, maybe it's just because it's so basic that I don't notice it being used. But well, I was going to say, sorry, maybe one comment is like if you look at this, there's I guess there's this book by Sarah called Trees, and there's lots of sort of fun examples of like decompositions of groups and so forth that you get there when you look at the group apps on uh, like a tree or a graph or something and. Right. Yeah, actually, um, it's yeah, not like a... you show that groups are free in many cases. Like if you yeah. have a torsion free subgroup of, um, like SL and yeah, anyway, sorry, SL2. Yeah. Yeah, this is how you can prove, give a, we said, I said you can give generators for SL2Z, but if you're a little more refined in your techniques, you can actually give a presentation of SL2Z. So you can figure out the generators and the relations. You can also completely calculate cohomology and all sorts of stuff. Um, and this technique of having it act on a tree in this case, this is a, just a one dimensional case of this sort of geometric group theory technique of having groups act on a lot of nice topological spaces um, works for certain low groups such as SL2Z. Um, and, and it will be finitely presented SL2Z, so finitely many relations too. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, um, I'll, I, I give the presentation in the problem set. I'm not asking you to prove it. I'm just telling you for your information. Um, but if you, well, I'll, maybe I'll just say it in words. So, I mean, there, I think the nicest presentation is, you know, there, there, there are two special reduced forms. One is X squared plus Y squared, and one is X squared plus X, Y plus Y squared. And, and what's special about them is they have more automorphism than all the other forms. So the first one has automorphism group cyclic of order four, and the second one has automorphism group cyclic of order six. Um, that was actually already on your previous problem set, that particular example. Um, and all the other ones have automorphisms of order two. Automorphism, and, but it's always the same order to automorphism. It's just, you know, minus one, zero, zero, minus one. That's an automorphism of every quadratic form. Just change the sign of X and Y. Um, and then it turns out that SL2Z is just the so-called amalgamated product of cyclic group of order four with cyclic group of order six amalgamated over this common subgroup they have, which is the cyclic group of order two. So, in, and from this, I mean, amalgamated product is some, you know, push out in the category of groups, but what it means concretely is that SL2Z is generated by an element, two elements subject to the relations that uh, the first one has order four, or the first one has fourth power equal to one, the second one has sixth power equal to one, and the second power of the first one is equal to third power of the second one. So that's a presentation of SL2Z by generators and relations. And it's kind of fun that you get this big, uh, you know, almost torsion free group uh, generated by two small cyclic subgroups, right? So this is the magic of non commutative groups that get, you start with something of order four and something of order six, they can generate like an infinite cyclic thing uh, when you combine them in the, in the right way. Um, I mean, the group won't, I mean, it will contain an infinite 
cyclic subgroup, right? This one, one, zero, one, for example. Um, that's the magic of non commutative words. Yeah. So, so SL2Z, you said it's amalgamated product of a cyclic group of order six and cyclic group of order four over a common subgroup of order two, if I heard you correctly. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you can see Sarah's book for the um, for a, a proof of that. There should be some way to do it using the action on binary quadratic forms as well, but it's much more vivid to use this geometric language. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess concrete also more generally, like all these SONs, they're all like finitely presented groups. And I don't know if that's something that's sort of obvious to see directly, but I guess you see it by like making it act on something that's reasonably finite, even if you don't have an explicit presentation. Like, I guess yeah. for SL2, you can probably sort of do it by hand, right? But for SON, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, right, because to do it by hand, you have to solve this problem of giving a fundamental domain. And um, yeah, I mean, that, the reduction theory has been generalized to more variables, but it's um, yeah, to make it explicit is not so easy. And when we say that SLNs are finitely presented, like SLN of Z or SLNs of SLN of Z? Yeah, well, you can generalize a bit, um, but mm. yeah. I see. Not, not of any ring, no, definitely. So, uh, uh, just now uh, you've committed a little before uh, at the end of the lecture that uh, the study of binary quadratic forms has some relation with the quadratic. Uh, extension of Q. So, uh, is there uh, uh, an analog similar to this uh, for uh, a trinary quadratic forms and uh, Q extension and so on? No. Or is it only special for Q? It's, this is so special. There's also not an analog over a, a, a ring different from Z. I mean, really, if you, if you perturb this setup slightly, this thing just breaks. It's a really special phenomenon. Um, yeah. Maybe it's worth noting there, based on the question, that the, the fact that you get a degree two extension, as Dustin had kind of hinted at, is more related to the fact that you're working with degree two forms, not that they're binary. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Probably degree three forms might be uh, cubic forms. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think you need both of them to be equal to, I think you need both that it's binary and that it's degree two. To, I mean, yeah. Yes, that's that's right, but I don't. Well, that could be a degree six extension, right? Because it's not, I mean, degree two extensions are always Galois, but or hmm? does that matter? I don't know if that matters. Sorry, ignore me. It, there's, it's just really, it only exists in this case. So it's kind of hard. I don't, I don't think you can point to any one specific aspect of it. Right. Um, yeah, it's really just a special phenomenon for the integers and binary quadratic forms. That's, yeah. I think this. I think this phenomenon extends at least a bit to binary cubic forms, where there's like some correspondence between binary cubic forms and then like cubic rings, like rings that are degree three over the integers. And then you can try and like figure out which of these cubic rings are actually like domains and then look at the like corresponding fraction fields. Like I think it's not, like maybe it's not like quite as nice as this binary quadratic case. I think you can try oh, and do something right. similar in this binary cubic case. Oh, I see, this is what you, I didn't know about this. So what is, um, what is this, uh, where is this done? Um, because I, so I don't know, like, like an original reference or anything, but I think in like Vargas paper, Varg, uh, 
And I, I think um, in this like Davenport Halbron stuff where they're like counting like cubic number fields. And they're like, uh -huh. the question's like how many like cubic number fields are there discriminants like bounded? I think the way they get, they get at this is by like comparing with counting binary cubic forms. Um, it, binary cubic forms. Yeah, so two case, variables not, to not at all obvious to me why these would be related. Okay, thank you for the, okay, I guess this is also what you were saying, Freddie, more or less. Um, this is new to me, is all I can say. Um, thanks for the information, guys. Ah, weird, okay. Yeah, I think the correspondence is like not so straightforward. Uh -huh. um, Jesus. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Um, I like guess weird that, I mean, like in the binary, in this case, like it really is, you're using the fact that you have two variables and the degree is two in some sense. I mean, it, it didn't. So I, I guess there's some reason why you can get rid of one of the variables in the cubic number field case. Yeah. Yes, I, guess, I think. Oh, you just don't let it vary or something? You don't let the coefficient vary? Uh, like the way you do it in the quadratic, this case is you use the norm function, which gives you a quadratic form, right? So in this case, what's going on? Yes, yeah, so I think in the chat, I left there, I linked a paper that um, talks to this in that second section. Then maybe also okay. some. Um, okay. Yeah, so this is giving asymptotic results. I guess it's probably not as exact a correspondence uh, as what you're saying. Um, yeah, very same particular correspondence is like less with like the number fields themselves and more with just like rings that happen to be like rank three over Z. Um, right. And then That's you have to like yeah. figure out, you know, which of these are domains and yeah, but that uh, which, happens in the in this case as well. It's just that almost all of them are domains, and then, I mean, like there's discriminant zero or something is the only thing you need to worry about. Um, so I can see this. Um, okay, so they interesting. There is a natural bijection between the set of GL two Z equivalence classes of integral binary quadratic forms and the set of isomorphism classes of cubic rings. Hmm. Wow, okay, it's some weird thing. It's not the norm anymore. Okay, weird, okay. Whoa. Huh. Okay, remarkable. All right. Well, I stand corrected. But uh, I don't quite see, it doesn't seem like the same construction to my eyes, but it, it, it does, yeah. Huh, wow. Weird wild world out there. Um, okay, any more questions? Uh, I think I think I have one maybe kind to, to verify something. So when you give me that example of of that arithmetic group action on a on a Riemannian manifold, that um, Riemannian manifold is called the associated symmetric space. You said. Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, it's nothing. I mean, it's nothing obscure. I mean, the you, you just take the same matrix group and take its real valued points. You get some Lie group, and then you mod out by its so-called maximal compact subgroup, which you can make explicit. I mean, for SLN, it's SON. You get some contractible space, which is nice, on which your group acts, and uh, well, it acts almost freely. If you pass to a finite index subgroup, it'll be free, and then it doesn't. The, the big, the big subtlety comes because it doesn't act co-compactly, and that um, if it got, when it does act co-compactly. You're very happy, but oftentimes it doesn't. For example, for SLN, 
and then you have to work to like compactify things and like all sorts of stuff. I mean, the, the modular curves themselves give examples of this with SL2Z acting on the upper half. SL2Z acting on the upper half, I mean, it's like the, the first example of this. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, I, as I said, I don't think I can come to the TA sessions today, but I'll see you guys tomorrow at the lecture. So, bye.